Awesome. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen then and we'll start the presentation. Okay, sweet. Thanks, Carla. So thank you everyone for joining us today. As you know, I'm joined by my partner, Scarlett Jackson for our 909 capstone project that we'll be going over today. And our capstone project is using earth observations to map the spatial distribution of buffalo grass in the Sonoran Desert. As you can see, these will be the agenda items that we'll be talking about today in our presentation. But before we do that, since we are using our study area within um, Tucson, Arizona, we would respectfully like to acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous people. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes with Tucson being home to the Tohono O'odham and the Yaqui nations. We're committed to the diversity and inclusion and the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign nations and indigenous communities through education partnerships and community service. And with that, I'll pass it over to Scarlett. Great. Thanks, Victor. Um, so just to start off uh, by introducing invasive species. Um, invasive plant species are those that have been introduced to an ecosystem where they did not historically evolve. And usually they outcompete the native flora in that ecosystem, which often decreases the biodiversity there. Um, and an invasive species uh, that we focused on for our project is buffalo grass. Buffalo grass is a bunch grass native to Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and is classified as an invasive noxious weed species in the Sonoran Desert of Arizona. Um, it has spread into many unwanted areas of the Southwest United States as it thrives in these arid conditions. And this is a problem because invasive grasses can particularly be damaging to not only the biodiversity of native flora by outcompeting the native species, but to the ecosystem as a whole, as they may lower spe species richness. Uh, there's an increase in fire fuel and can be a change in fire regimes as a result of those uh, mass amounts of fire fuel from the grass. Specifically, African bunch grasses can have significant effects on size distributions of cactus, such as the Soro cactus, and could even drive local extinction in some cases. For our project, we partnered with the Buffalo Grass Outreach Program for Save Our Soros from the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum. So thanks, Scarlett. And so for the project objectives, we've broken down into three sections. First, using Google Earth Pro, we captured the growth patterns of buffalo grass within the study area using a grid system. And we were referencing a visual key predetermined and pre-made by the Sonoran Desert Museum. Second, we assessed mapping workflow between involved parties through routine meetings and um, workflow management. And lastly, we then use using ArcGIS Pro, visualize the buffalo grass growth trends using the geoprocessing tools that will also allow us to develop the analytical data to do a contingency analysis. So here we have a Google Earth image of our study area. Um, we focused on Tumamuk Hill and Sentinel Peak or a mountain. Um, and as Victor mentioned, this land is managed by the University of Arizona and Pima County. So just a quick overview of our methodology here. Um, we were assessing the feasibility of mapping buffalo grass using a visual key. Um, we moved forward with uh, using five criteria for the proposed methodology for mapping dormant buffalo grass in the Sonoran Desert using aerial ortho imagery. We had multiple mappers using this key to map the same area of buffalo grass infestations over the course of the project using Google Earth Pro imagery. And then we used uh, contingency tables and ArcGIS Pro 
um, to assess the visual interpretation of each mapper's presence polygons. And this could help us determine if the methodology could be widely distributed and produce accurate mapped buffalo grass infestations. And then here is a workflow uh, model of our methodology. We used three tools. Um, one was that key for the buffalo grass using the five criteria, uh, the Google Earth imagery, and then a fishnet or the grid that we use to organize our mapping of buffalo grass. We mapped buffalo grass on Tuvuma Hill and A Mountain, and then compared maps of the multiple mappers and compared variants. And then each week we adjusted and calibrated to create the most efficient first steps in this uh, early detection rapid response methodology. So here's the proposed visual key for mapping dormant buffalo grass in the Sonoran Desert. Um, the five criteria that we took into account were texture, color, the size of the plant, the size of the infestation, and the aspect that it was growing on. And if it totaled in five or more points, it was highly considered to be buffalo grass. And Victor will go over some of the examples with visuals. Thanks, Scarlett. So for texture, this is the most unique identifying feature of buffalo grass within the region. So we marked this as a high point value. Uh, what we were looking for was essentially anything on the surface, on the aerial imagery that looked pebble-like or kind of like an orange rind skin texture. And for color, since we were looking for dormant buffalo grass as it's best uh, visually identifiable, we looked for straw-like yellow um, features within a surface. And for plant size, since that was pretty contingent with other um, relative grasses, we tried to assess that anything that's less than a meter in diameter from the satellite image can be considered buffalo grass. So that way we don't confuse it, as you can see in the picture of the right next to the brittle bush and other shrubs within the same area. And then for the infestation size, this is generally just going over the growth span of the invasive grass, in this case, buffalo grass. So you can see that we're measuring from one side to the opposite end of the growth for buffalo grass. For aspect, it's pretty much just at which um, orientation of the mountain, north, south, east, or west, can the buffalo grass most predominantly be growing. This was predetermined through the Arizona Desert Museum that essentially only the north facing slopes of a mountain do not grow predominant buffalo grass. So we excluded that from our study area. And then here, you're essentially just seeing a visual sample of what a mapper could produce in Google Earth Pro, where you can see the red outlines, basically boundaries for the buffalo grass growth within a, any given area. And you can also see other relative shrubs that you could essentially get confused, but it's a good key, at least for the mappers to understand what we want to look for. So here's a more uh, specified view of our study area. This was the grid that we overlaid um, on the study area to map buffalo grass. And then the grid cells that are highlighted in a minty green color are the ones that were focused on and that all mappers were able to map um, with presence polygons for buffalo grass. Um, and then that um, mapping data was overlaid with each other. So here's an example um, of some mappers polygons. We um, had the individual mappers overlay their polygons with the standard mapper. So here we have the individual mapper polygons in black and the standard mapper polygons in red. So the individual mappers would be me or Victor or anyone else participating in the project. And then the standard mapper is someone with extensive experience in mapping buffalo grass. So we use them as the gold standard. And this was somebody from the Sonoran Desert Museum. And here, this is just a geoprocessing tool setup that we have 
once we get into ArcGIS Pro from getting the KML file of Google Earth Pro over to ArcGIS to visualize the maps, correlate them visually and see the spatial distribution and also get the attribute field so that we can use that to then do a contingency analysis for our project. And so here, this is just the general uh, methodology that we came up with using other models. Um, so it's just uh, basically error matrix contingency table. We did a true positive, false positive, false negative analysis where the true positives are where the mapper and the standard both agreed in the area for buffalo grass presence. False positives was where the mapper didn't uh, found buffalo grass, but the standard did not. No buffalo grass and the false negative was from the mapper, but it was actually there according to the standard. And then true negatives are complementary of each other where there was a lack of buffalo grass within a specific cell. And then on the bottom, you're just seeing the accuracy formulas that we used to determine the user accuracy for the presence of, of buffalo grass within a cell in the study area, and as well as the overall accuracy at how much the mapper's data compared to the standards data as a whole. And so on this, you're seeing Scarlet and my data. You can see that most of our features were measured in square feet based off of the projected coordinate system that we used. And most to focus on is the map for accuracy. So like I mentioned earlier, you're seeing based on those percentage values at what point and how much of buffalo grass for mapper accuracy was present for each user versus the standard and for overall accuracy, how much did we agree on the fact that there was buffalo grass present and also not buffalo grass present within the study area as a complement to each other. So you can just see Scarlet and mine data as how we've used our different mapping styles to find buffalo grass. Great, thank you, Victor. So uh, in our discussion, we just wanted to go over some disclaimers to using this methodology. Um, a disclaimer to the visual ID that we were mapping dormant buffalo grass during this project because it was more visually recognizable by aerial imagery. And then we only mapped buffalo grass in images from 2016 to 2019. Um, another thing to consider is that the mapping style of each individual uh, going through this methodology can be different. Um, some mappers could map with um, a greater attention to detail while some take a more generalized approach and the accuracy may depend on the style of the individual mappers. Um, overall, we thought the efficiency of using this ID key, the manual mapping and the geoprocessing um, was pretty good. It took uh, roughly one to three hours for each mapper to map a grid cell, um, which is important to know if this methodology was to be replicated. And then we were troubleshooting the protocol and making revisions each week to make sure that these first steps in the early detection rapid response methodology were as efficient as possible. Um, and in conclusion, um, we had 74 to 79% overall accuracy of individual mappers. So that was Victor and I, um, which we think is pretty good depending on the uh, management use of the methodology. Um, so we thought this was a great first few steps in the early detection rapid response methodology. Um, but we also acknowledge that further automation is required beyond the scope of this project. And so for future work with the Sonoran Desert Museum, there will be points of improvement with the workflow so that way we can develop a higher accuracy. And once we get that in line, we can also then start automating the buffalo grass visualization using code. So that way we let the computers do their thing and then it's just QC through human correction. Um, the Sonoran Desert Museum will continue to use volunteers to improve on that mapping criteria and the visualization key. And then ideally, we would then like to move that towards using this visual visualization technique to be incorporated to ID other invasive grasses across the country, across the globe as well. 
And in, for local Tucson's, if anyone's ever interested in just helping out, they uh, have a routine buffalo grass mapathon on given periods of the year. They provide educational tools online to be able to identify via remotely uh, specific invasive grasses. It's not only buffalo grass. So if you're interested, you can visit the website. Uh, what you're seeing on here is just kind of like the dashboard that they've set up in partnership with Mexico for the two buffalo grass. And I think the other one is fountain grass within um, the Sonoran Desert Museum and how just you can see that mappers are going across. They also have um, local uh, pull, uh, weed poles if you are found in Tucson that you can participate in as well. And then uh, we just wanted to say a huge thank you to Chris, um, our advisor and GIST director, Aaron from University of Arizona, who is a huge part of our project, Kim and Yaching from the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, who are also um, key components of our project. And then, of course, respectfully acknowledge the native lands of the Tohono O'odham and Yaqui tribes. Uh, so thanks to everyone who was a huge support and help to our project. Thank you.